All right, and then I told you, you could do it another way um, on B and still get the right answer. So you could do the amount after nine hours and then one half raised to a third, because that's a third of the half life. Um, but to get the next question, it's helpful if you did it this way. And so if we want an equation, D of T, that gives the amount of dextromethorphan um, in your system after T hours, you would say that D of T equals that 20, which is the initial amount, and one half raised to the T divided by three. So that is actually a half-life formula that you may have learned it before. I'm not sure. Precalculus might be the first time you're seeing that. So it is the initial amount. Multiply by one half. And then that's raised to, the, to T divided by whatever the half-life is. And the half-life is a predetermined amount. Um, so to do these problems, you have to know what the half-life is of these different chemicals or radioactive material, all radioactive material like uranium, plutonium, they all have a half-life that has already been discovered and they all decay at that same amount. All right, and then for three, you want to know what percent of drug remains in your body after one hour. So the easiest way to do this is say that the initial value is, a, is one, and then one half raised to the one third is going to give you 0.7937. So that's going to be 79.37% remains. So what percent would be eliminated? Okay, you just take 100% and subtract that, and it gives you the amount that was eliminated. All right, and then what this next question is, they took um, part of the label and blacked out how often you're supposed to take the medicine. So we can figure out how often you're supposed to take this medicine. So customers are instructed to use the medicine as directed. For the average adult, dextromethorphan um, is effective in quantities over 8 milligrams. So we're trying to figure out what this should say where it's blacked out. So what we're going to do is take that formula, 20 and then 1 half raised to the T over 3, and set that equal to 8. And we're going to figure out how long it takes for there to only be 8 milligrams left in your body. And then you would need to take the medicine again because it wouldn't be effective. And this is what you learned yesterday. So what would, if we want to solve this for T, what you do initially is try to get the exponential expression alone. So this is the exponential expression. So the first thing you would do is divide by 20. Good. And so 8 divided by 20 is 0.4, or 4 tenths. All right, then we want to write this in logarithmic form. So you would start with log. What would the base be? 1 half of 0.4 equals t over 3. Now you can find log base one half of 0.4 in your calculator. Huh? Bless you. <clears throat> so we got a log base. You can do one half here or 0.5, whatever you want to do. All right, so that should equal t over three. And then what would you do with that 3 to solve it for T? You would multiply by it. Now, one thing I always tell my AP students is that you only round once. 
So it's fine to write that down on your paper, but when you multiply by three, like multiply this whole number by three. So you can just do times three, and that's gonna be the answer. That's gonna be what T is. So how often do you think we should take this medicine? Every four hours. Every four hours, good. That'd be every four hours, and every three hours, four times a day. It's gonna be every. Well, there's 24 hours in a day. It does tell you not to exceed four doses in 24 hours. That's every six hours. So you have to you have to be careful. Okay. Now, when I first did number five, I did it wrong. I misunderstood what it was telling us to do. So. Um, suppose that you take this 30 milliliters or 20 um, milligrams of the dextro, whatever, and um, you do it, and then four hours later you take it again, and then you take it again, and take it again to do this table. All right, so for 10 a.m., that's going to be two hours since you took it the first time, and so it would be 20 and then one half raised to the two thirds. And that's going to give you 12.60 milligrams. All right. And then at 12 p.m., four hours have passed. So it's going to be 20, one half to the four thirds, which is 7.94. However, what happens every four hours? You take it again. And so that's going to be you get 20 more milligrams at four hours. And so now you have 27.494 milligrams. So 20 is thrown out the window. And our new initial amount that we're looking at is the 27.94. And we're starting over. So now it's, it's how long it's been since you took your last dose. So it's been two hours since you took the last dose. All right, so now it's been four hours since you took the last dose, but you're going to take another dose. So you have 31.09 milligrams. All right, and then we're starting over. Where T is two again. This problem doesn't tell you like how much is a dangerous amount of this drug, um, but it probably has to do with not exceeding four doses in 24 hours because you're still you still have it in your system from when you took it initially, so you start probably getting too much. This is also why the medicine is more effective later on in the day is because you you have more of it in your system. All right, so if at 8 o'clock you don't take it again, you're going to have 12.34 milligrams in your system. Uh, if you do take it again, you're going to have 32.34 milligrams in your system. And that should be the last time you take it. <laughs> Bless you. Then you switch over to NyQuil, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully NyQuil uses a different medicine, so it's fine if you can take it. All right, so on the other side, um, we're going to fill in some notes. We're going to fill in the, the half-life formula that we're talking about and then some old formulas that we learned about in the past. All right, so for your quick notes, models help predict how certain quantities change over time.
All right, so um, just like a, a basic common formula is y equals a sub zero e to the kt. This is a common growth model. Yes, or zero. All right, so in your science classes, you've hopefully taken enough science classes at this point that you might know what, anytime a subscript is zero, do you know what that means? Like V sub zero, A sub zero, nobody knows that? Okay, a sub zero usually means initial in a science <coughs> formula. So it's bless you. bless you. The same thing here. So A sub zero is going to be the initial amount. K is going to be the growth, rate of growth or decay. And you can just look at the formula and know if it's growth or decay. Uh, if K is positive, so K is greater than zero, it's going to be growth. And if K is less than zero or negative, it's going to be decay. And then T is going to be time. All right, so on the other side of this dashed line, we're going to do some formulas like we talked about today and some we've talked about in the past. So the first one we're going to do is the half-life formula. It's going to be y equals a sub 0, 1 half, raised to the t divided by k. And in this case, k is the half-life which is a predetermined value that tells you how long it takes for half of the original amount to be left over. All right. If something is doubling like every hour or every day or whatever, we can have a formula for that too. So it'd be y equals a sub zero. And then for doubling, the base is just going to be two. 2 to the t. What do you think it would be for tripling? 3 to the t, yep. All right, and then um, um, investments. Investment problems are really good problems to work with here because, like, if you know, like, at a certain age you want to have, like, $500,000 or whatever, um, then you can, you can use that to figure out what you need to invest or things like that. Um, so we need to know the compound interest formula. Now, usually on money problems, instead of A sub zero, uh, you use P for principal. Um, so typically it's A is equal to P, and then it's going to be 1 plus R over N to the NT. Hopefully that looks familiar to you. And then we also have continuously compounded interest. And it's going to be A equals PE to the RT. Now, this is actually the last unit that we're going to... The last lesson we're going to get, learn in this unit. Um, and so next week we are going to have a test. I most likely will give you these formulas. Um, most of you are seniors. You're done taking, you know, tests to help get you into college. I don't even know if these formulas are on the ACT. Um, but anyway, um, on the in real life, if you need to know the formula for compound interest, you can look it up. 
So I will probably give you these formulas. I won't tell you what every little part means, but hopefully you'll be able to recognize it. All right, so let's look at number one. So estimates of numbers in millions of U.S. households with digital televisions is given by that function D, where T represents the years after 2000. So the question A is, is the number of households with digital televisions increasing or decreasing between 2003 and 2007? So just making that decision, you look at K. And in this case, in all the cases, well, no, except for the half-life formula, a K is going to be the number in the exponent that's multiplied by T. Would you guys say that that K value is positive or negative? Positive. So that would mean that that is growth and that then is increasing. All right, and then B asks, what does this 32, or sorry, 30.92 represent? It's the initial amount, kind of, of TVs. What is the initial year we're looking at? 2000, good job. So this is in 2000, 30.92 million people, we'll say million U.S. households, not people owned TVs. All right, what about this point one one seven one? That's okay. That means that each year there was approximately 11.71% growth. All right, and then C wants us to find um, when the number of households will reach 100 million. So what we're going to do is take the equation and set it equal to 100. Because it's in millions, we don't set it equal to 100 million. We're just going to set it equal to 100. And figure out, whoop, just kidding. Figure out what T is going to be. All right, what would you guys do first? Divide by 30. Exactly, divide by that 30.92. All right, then we're going to write it in exponential form. What type of logarithm is it going to be if the base is E? So the natural log of that 3.234 is equal to 0.1171t. Now this is a situation where you only round once. So what you would want to do in your calculator is do the 100 divided by that. All right, and then when I want to take the natural log, I don't use the rounded version. You can do one of two things. You can do natural log and then go up and choose it and do it that way. Or you could do, I can't right now, it's going to be wrong, but up above, if I would have done natural log and then chosen uh, answer by doing second negative that also works. So either way, we, we don't want to use a rounded answer. You only round once, only at the end of the problem. Okay, so where are we? When I type that in, I got about 1.738. All right, so your last step is to divide by that 0.1. 171. And again, you pull it up from the problem 
and you get 10.02. And this was in years. So what year is that? 2010, good. So those are the kind of problems we're going to do in this lesson where you have a real life scenario and you just have to answer questions about it. All right, the next one is about money. So money questions are always good. So an investor invests $1,000 into an account that has continuously compounded interest. If after three years he has $1,450, what's the interest rate? So we're going to use that green formula up there, continuously compounded interest. We are going to put... 1,000 in for P, we're going to put 3 in for T, and 1,450 in for A. And what we want to find is R. So R is our variable. All right, and then you learned how to do this yesterday. So same steps that we just did. The first thing you do is divide by 1,000. Then we're going to write this in logarithmic form. All right, and you can type in the natural log of 1.45 in the calculator. All right, and then your last step is to divide by 3. So what would that be as a decimal? Just move that decimal point over two places. Good. That's some pretty high interest. Hopefully, if you guys can find an account like that, then you definitely be investing your money. <laughs> All right. And then this last question is kind of tricky. Um, so on the Great Brit British Baking Show, um, a contestant takes their cake out of a 180-degree Celsius oven and puts it in a refrigerator whose temperature is set at 3 degrees Celsius. After 10 minutes, the cake has cooled to 150 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the cake in degrees Celsius, 10 minutes after it's removed from the oven, can be modeled by this situation or this equation. We're going to find A and K. Now, if this plus 3 wasn't there, this would be an easier question because A would just be like the cake is going to be the temperature of the oven when you take it out. But that 3 kind of messes that up, makes this more challenging than a lot of the other problems we do. So what we know is that time 0, when you take the cake out of the oven, the cake is the temperature of the oven. So what I can do now is put this in for C and put zero in for T, and I can use that to find A. So this ends up being A times E to the zero. What is E to the zero? What's everything except 0 to 0? It's just 1. So this ends up being 180 equals A plus 3. So A is 177. So that's half of it. We need to find A. Now we need to find K. So what I know is that after 10 minutes, the cake is 150 degrees Celsius. So now I can take 150, set it equal to, I know A is 177, E. I know that T is 10. And I can solve that for K by first subtracting 3. Dividing by 177.
writing in logarithmic form and dividing by 10. I'm going through that kind of fast because that's what we did yesterday and I think you guys are okay. Now does it make sense that K is negative? Yeah, because the cake is cooling, so the temperature is decreasing. K needs to be negative if it's decreasing. All right, now we have all the parts to our equation. So our equation is T is the only variable, so C of T is 177, whoops, that doesn't look like a 7, E to the negative point 01857T plus 3. So B wants to know the temperature of the cake after 45 minutes. What would I do with that 45? Thank you. Plug it in for T. And you can just let your calculator do all that work for you if you want to. And you get 79.75 degrees Celsius. Okay. What questions do you guys have on, I guess, applications of exponential and logarithmic? What? Why does it take so long? This is pre-calculus. It's a challenging class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.